Blessed art thou among them, and blessed the fruit of thy Jesus. Holy Mary, Holy Mary, Holy Mary pray for our sins. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by light of the Holy Spirit, grant it by the same Spirit, and be truly wise and ever joyous in his consolation to the same Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lady Fatima, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Saint Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. O God's angels and saints, pray for us. in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. The convent of nuns, very holy nuns. Uh, the mother superior who was in her mid 90s, was very sick, and she was in the infirmary, and she was um, close to dying. So one of the nuns that would bring her something to eat brought her a. Um, cup of warm milk and she um, rejected that. The other young nuns were surrounding her and um, so the sister went back to the kitchen and instead of milk she poured whiskey in the mug. So there's 90% whiskey and 10% milk. So she brought it back to the elderly nun and all the younger nuns were watching her and she smelled this and she started to drink and drink and drink and drink and drank it to the last drop. So the nun said, Sister, before you die, please give us some good advice before we die. She said, under no condition should you ever sell that cow. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, let's move into the second lecture tonight, and I just tell you this is. Uh, the only time we have two lectures will be today because we have to give you a lot of material. So tonight we're going to be talking about our program and the most important part of our program. Our program is somewhat like this tripod. Tripod has three legs. If we take one of those legs down, it's going to collapse. First leg of the tripod is the lecture that we give you every week. Second will be immediately after our talk, you're going to be going to find where your groups are and we'll be giving you your handouts. So next week, all of you are going to be sharing for about a minute, maybe two minutes. How did God speak to you in your meditation? How did God speak to you? Because God is going to be speaking to you every time you do your meditation. And the third, and this is the heart of our program, is your daily period of prayer that we call I like to call it your holy hour in honor of Fulton Sheen, okay? Holy hour. I did not say happy hour. <laughs> well, it could be happy holy hour if you want to. But your holy hour. We're going to talk briefly about that. Okay, listen now. 
about prayer. About prayer. I, I, can, I can teach you how to pray. I'm a teacher. I was a teacher before I was a priest, okay? So I can teach you, I can teach you how to pray. Uh, we talk about meditation and contemplation, Theresian prayer, lecture divina, uh, the prayer of the rosary, the examination. I mean, I'm, an, I'm one of those nonstop talkers. I mean, I can go on and on and on, okay? I can teach you how to pray. But listen, I cannot give you the desire to pray. Can't, can't give it to you. I repeat, I can teach you how to pray. I can teach you the method. But I cannot, I cannot give you the desire to pray. On a personal note, I'm eternally grateful for this gift that, that God gave to me. All of, the, all of us have gifts, and I humbly recognize the gift that God has given to me. Ever since I was a little child, I always liked to pray. I've been a priest for way more than 30 years. I'm old, no? And I never met a child or teenager in 30 years that told me, Father, I really like to pray. You've got children. They don't like to pray. When I was 15 in New Jersey, I'd walk to school. When I was 15, I prayed three rosaries on my fingers when I was walking to school in Ridgewood, New Jersey. You know? That's a grace. It's a grace. You know? How many 15-year-old kids are praying three rosaries walking to school? You know? I mean, that's why I'm a priest. That's why I'm preaching on prayer, because taste and see the goodness of the Lord. So I can teach you how to pray. But you have to beg the Lord for a desire to pray. I love St. Augustine. St. Augustine, how great. His writings, no? What does St. Augustine say? He says the human heart is made to love. It's made to love. But we have to choose wisely the object of our love and love with all our hearts. Ah, Augustine. We're made to love. Choose wisely the object of your love and love with all your heart. What is the object of your love? It's not an object, it's Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. It's Jesus Christ. So let's talk about your holy hour. Talk about, okay, when where, how, and why. And respond to those questions that you use when you're doing a literary critique of you study literature, okay? Okay, when, where, how, and why. Let's try to respond to those four questions. Okay, when. I would suggest you do your holy hour as early as possible. Hello, anyone home? <laughs> er, as early as possible. And I'll give you, I could give you many reasons, I'll give you three off, off the top of my head. Number one, the imitation of Christ. Read, read Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, you have a typical day in the life of Jesus Christ. Jesus is preaching, he's healing, he's casting out devils, but then it says Jesus, he got up, when? He got up way before dawn. Let's say that again. Way before dawn. If you didn't hear me, way before dawn, okay? What does that mean? Huh? 3.30, 4 o'clock. 
And it says he was absorbed in prayer. Not distracted, absorbed in prayer. He's our model. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, right? He's the master. He's the teacher. He's our guide. He's the pattern that we want to model our lives upon. Now, that, does that mean you have to give, get up at 3.30? No. But give the Lord your first fruits. Remember Cain and Abel? Who are you, Cain or Abel? I think your name is Cain Abel, right? <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a truncated word. Get rid of Cain and stick with Abel, okay? Abel. I've got, I've got a great idea. St. Peter Chanel. You ever hear that church? It's in Wine Gardens. We open up the doors of our church at 445. You know, driving, there's not that much traffic. <laughs> So you can arrive at 445 at St. Peter Chanel and do your holy hour. Then guess what we have at 6 o'clock in the morning? Not the casino, okay? <laughs> you've got mass. So you've got the holy hour and you've got your mass all done by 625. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah? Hallelujah? Amen or oh me? Okay. <laughs> Okay, so, so if you like, you're, you're more than welcome. But if you're not going to be able to make it to St. Peter Chanel, or if you can't make it here because maybe the church isn't open. Uh, oh, is it really? Oh, well, then come here. Come here. Oh, wow, great. You have 24 adoration? Okay, no excuse, okay? Oh, wow, what a blessing. Praise the Lord. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord, yes. When I was in Italy, um, you know, the, the, the Americans have a tendency to have a big, big breakfast and a small lunch, whereas the Italians, a small breakfast and a big lunch. One of my Italian friends, after the big prawn, so he said, I'm going up to my room now. It's the favorite time of the day. I'm going up to my room to do my horizontal meditation. <laughs> yeah, the psalmist says, meditate upon your word on my, bed, on my bed day and night. No. So if you, if you can, that's the ideal, to pray in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Now, if that's not possible, in your home, you have to create a sacred place, your own sanctuary, where you have an image of Jesus, an image of Mary, the statue of St. Joseph, maybe your guardian angel, maybe St. Martin. In other words, you have to kind of create a spiritual environment. And then, you know, you can light a couple of candles Nothing wrong with that. And they burn some incense, but not marijuana. Okay, you can burn some incense. <laughs> In other words, you have to kind of create the milieu. And then, once you've got your place, when you pray, I like to, I like to use sports, sports analogies, okay? In sports, some, we've got some athletes here. Before you get out into the baseball diamond, you've got to warm up before. I played a lot of sports. I played baseball at Villanova, no? so I know a little bit about sports. No? So before getting on the diamond there, you've got to warm up. <laughs> I'm going to pull a hamstring, you're out for four weeks, huh? So as you have to warm up for baseball or soccer or any sport, you've got to warm up to God, yes? You've got to change gears. So these are the Ignatian steps. you got your place. Oh, Fulton Sheen says this. You've heard of Fulton Sheen? Never 
do your holy hour without first having your first cup of coffee. Amen? <laughs> Number one occasion, I just said, I'm going to practice penance. I'm not going to have my coffee. So I didn't have my coffee. And this, is what, this was my holy hour. Are you watching? I was agreeing with everything I read. No? <laughs> I give full consent to the word of God. So having your cup of coffee to wake you up, nothing wrong, Fulton Sheen recommends it. Then you're there, and as you're warming up, these are, this is what Ignatius suggests. Okay, you place yourself in the presence of God. Okay? Place yourself in the presence of God. Then Ignatius says, if I can say it in Spanish and in English, Imagina la mirada del Señor. <laughs> Imagina la mirada del Señor. Translation? To imagine the Lord is looking at you with a lot of love. The Lord is contemplating you, you're contemplating Him. And then you pray the Hail Mary. Always do your meditations asking Mary to pray for you and to pray with you. Amen? If you do that, your meditations are going to go well. Has a Blessed Mother ever failed you? Never failed me either. Mary will always be faithful to you to bring you to Christ in prayer. So say the Hail Mary calmly. Then after that, you're going to invite the spiritual director of these spiritual exercises into your prayer. Who is the spiritual director? Father Broom. No. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8. Any of you know Romans chapter 8? No, we're not Protestants, Father. Okay, Romans chapter 8. <laughs> Was that reading your mind? Yes, Father. We don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so that we can say, Abba, Papi. Romans chapter 8. So it's the Holy Spirit. He's the one that teaches us how to pray. You know who I really admire is John Paul II. I've read most of his writings, most of his encyclicals I've read. You probably have also, right? One of his works called Crossing the Threshold of Hope, you have the mystical life of John Paul II in which he says his prayer was uniting his his groans with the groaning of the Holy Spirit. Wow. John Paul II. Uniting his groans with the groaning of the Holy Spirit. And once you've done that, you've got your meditations. So every meditation we have written out for you. Okay, I've written, written out this program in great detail. And I'm always trying to add to it, chip away. I'm working on another program now. I'm, I'm always writing in my free time. No? So what you're going to have is you're going to have a biblical passage. 90% of these exercises are biblical passages. Then after the biblical passage, you're going to have a commentary written by yours truly. Okay? So there you have it. Biblical passage. You're going to have an artistic depiction of it. You're going to have a running commentary. So you're going to be having, for example, tomorrow, Exodus chapter 3, Moses before the burning bush, and meditating upon principle and foundation. That's your, that's your material tomorrow. Okay. I'd like to offer to you, as a teaching technique or guide, I'd like to offer to you a, meth a method. Now, there are many methods. 
But what's captivated me over the past two years was what, what Pope Benedict XVI wrote in one of his, I think it's uh, an apostolic exhortation, maybe an encyclical, but one of, his, one of his documents, which is called Verbum Domine, which is English for the word of, the, the word of God. In that, there's a number where, where Ben the 16th presents as a method of prayer, it's called, it's called Lectio Divina. Have you ever heard of that? Lectio Divina. Which he offers these words, Lectio, Meditatio, Contemplatio, Oratio, and actio. I repeat, lectio, meditatio, contemplatio, oratio, e actio. And I added, I, I added Baker's, Baker's dozen, transformatio. Okay. How's your Latin? Malo. Okay. okay. <laughs> lectio means you got to read. You got to read. So we have, a, we have a dished out for you. You've got to read. In Beginners in the Spiritual Life, Teresa of Avila says, never go to prayer without a book. Teresa of Avila, never. Never go to prayer without a book. So if you're starting out in the spiritual life, you start to grow in prayer by, by doing reading, a lot of reading. You start to form your mind with a, with the truth, and the truth will set us free. So we give you we give you a lot to read, but that's not the end. That's that's we're, we're, we're igniting the flame. But prayer will often start through the faculty that Aquinas and Augustine says is the intellect. You start with your intellect. So let you read. Then you have meditatio. What does that mean? Okay, meditatio means you gotta think. You go to the original Greek. Our great example is the Blessed Virgin Mary. What did Mary do? She pondered the word of God in her heart. You see that two times, right? with the shepherds, and when Jesus is lost for three days, Mary's pondering in her heart, what is this? Now, if you go to the original Greek, the word is, to, is ruminate. Now, ruminate, did you, any of you ever see a cow chewing the cud? Ever see that? Yes, yeah, my teenage son. No, it's not that, no. A cow, <laughs> cow chewing the cud. Chewing and masticating and chewing, almost pulverizing it. That's the original Greek. So what Mary did was she thought, she pondered, she thought again. So these exercises, my friends, it's a lot of work. It's work. As the athletes say, no pain, no gain, right? No freebies, huh? You know, you got to work. So the exercises, they depend more on you than anyone else. If you're generous, God is going to give you a lot of graces. This is the word Ignatius uses in annotation number five. It's a big college word, a compound Greek word. Magnanimity. You ever hear that word? Magna anima. Magnanimity. Magna means what? Great. Anima means soul. Great soulness. Simple English, generosity. You got to be generous with God. Okay, then after meditatio, you've got contemplatio. What does that mean? Hello? So you have to use your imagination. Is our ima imagination good or bad? It's neutral. Neither good nor bad. 
We can use it for good, we can use it for evil. Ignatius wants to train us to use our imagination to imagine Jesus Christ, to imagine God. But these exercises are going to help us to train our imagination. Teresa of Avila calls your imagination la loca de la casa. La loquita de la casita. In other words, our, our imagination goes in many directions. We all get distracted at times, right? Remember a story of Saint Bernard, not the dog, but the saint. He was um, on his horse talking about prayer and next to him was a friend. And his, uh, Bernard said that sometimes I have distractions in my prayer and his friend said, uh-uh, I was a born mystic. I never have distractions. So Saint Bernard said, if you don't have, I'll tell you, if you can say the Our Father, one Our Father without a distraction, I'll give you my horse. I'll give you my horse. So he knelt down and Saint Bernard was on his horse, sitting on the saddle. And so the man starts to pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be the name. Then he says, will you give me the saddle also with the horse? <laughs> <laughs> I think we all have those saddles and horses when we're praying, right? So contemplation, we're learning, training ourselves to use our imagination for good. Then oracio, what's that? You got to talk to God. So once you go from the intellect you seep into the heart. That's the center of prayer, is your heart. The heart. And once your, the Holy Spirit moves your heart with affections. What are affections? Love, thanksgiving, praise, wonder, contrition, oblation, giving of yourself, maybe some fears, maybe some worries. All the gamuts of the emotions can be part of your prayer life. And you open up and you talk to God. Talk to God in your own words. Talk to the Father, talk to Jesus, talk to Mary, that's called a triple colloquy. You can talk with one, you can talk to two, you can talk to three. Prayer is, everyone has to learn his own prayer style. Everyone has to learn his own prayer style. St. Faustina says, God deals with every soul in a different way. Teresa of Avila says, you learn how to pray by praying. Amen? <laughs> you learn how to pray by praying? You learn how to pray by praying? How do you learn how to cook? By burning the tortillas, right? I mean, you have to learn. How do you learn how to, learn to hit, hit a curveball? Wait on it, punch it to the opposite field. I mean, you have to practice, right? <laughs> practice makes perfect. Practice makes perfect. Oratio. And then after oratio, axio. What's that? So what you do is you take your prayer and then you translate your prayer into your life. You become what they call a contemplative in action. Amen? You're called to be a contemplative in action. Who's our example? The Blessed Mother, right? The Annunciation, Mary Contemplative, the Visitation Action. So our prayer life should imbue penetrate and transform our whole life. They should. We tend to imitate those with whom we associate, right? right? We tend to imitate those with whom we associate, yes. And then after that transformatio, what does that mean? 
No longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Prayer will transform us. Amen? So there you have your method. So the time, as early as possible. The place, in front of the Blessed Sacrament if you can, or in your home. The method, how? Lectio Divinum, using those steps. Lectio, meditatio, contemplatio, oratio, actio, e transformatio. And you do that on a daily basis. After you finish, you're going to be writing down how God spoke to you. It's called the revision. So that when you go to your group, you're going to have a group of maybe 10, 14, maybe 15 people. You have a facilitator, and each one of you are going to share for about a minute or two. And you're going to say, this is how God spoke to me. For example, tomorrow you're going to be meditating upon principle foundation, but also Exodus chapter 3, which is Moses before the burning bush. Yeah, your name tomorrow is going to be Moses, okay? You're going to be Moises, okay? You're going to be Moses, and you're going to be going in front of that burning bush, you're going to hear the voice, take off those sandals. Then you hear a voice, come closer. And as you come closer, it's no longer a fire, but it's the sacred heart of Jesus that has this fiery love for you. Come closer. Come closer. And you end up by resting on the sacred heart of Jesus, who has this fiery love for you. And what do you hear in the beating of his heart? He's saying, I love you. 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 And you rest on the bush, on the sacred heart for a half an hour, and you get up and you're filled with consolation, you're no longer the same person. You had a mystical touch in that prayer, and now you're firmly convinced that God really loves you. You heard that a thousand times, but finally it went from your head to your heart, you're a new person. And you leave the meditation, and you no longer see people, events with the same eyes, but you're seeing it through the eyes and heart of Jesus Christ. Amen? So, finally, principle and foundation. You're going to be given a sheet. Principle and foundation gives us a very clear, concise, short explanation of these exercises and why we're here in this world. And it's this. You were created for a purpose. This is the purpose of your creation. You're created to praise God. Amen? Amen? You're created to reverence God. You're created to serve God. And by means of that, to save your immortal soul. Amen? Amen. That's principle and foundation. You're created to praise God. To reverence God. To serve God. And by means of that, to save your soul. I like languages, and Thomas Aquinas is one of the best writers on defining short terms. What is the most used word in the United States and probably the most misinterpreted? Love. Love. What is your definition of love? Probably going to have 400 different essays here. Okay? This is the definition of Aquinas, the angelic doctor. Love is willing the good of the other. I like that. Love is willing the good of the other. What is the greatest good of the other? The salvation of his soul. How many of you have children? Do you love your children? Are you concerned about the salvation of their souls? Are you willing to suffer for them? Are you willing to do your holy hours for them? So love, love is measured by 
a willingness to suffer for the loved one. That's what love is. Willing the good. And the greatest good is the salvation of their soul. That's principle and foundation. Second, the second part is this. The proper use of creation. If you go to daily mass, some of you go to daily mass, what are we reading in the first reading? Genesis, for the past two weeks, right? God created everything, everything that God created is good. Then why is there evil? Everything God created is good, why is there evil? Because instead of using creation for its proper purpose and end, we abuse it. We abuse it. Everything that, everything that God has given to us is good, but we can abuse it. That's the second part of the principle of foundation. Is eating good? You like to eat? Got a good appetite? Hello? What happens after this? You go out to McDonald's and you, you eat five hamburgers and you eat six. <laughs> you get sick, huh? You're going to get fat, too. <laughs> and nothing wrong with the hamburgers. No? So you, you can apply this to everything. One of the biggest abuses, I made a reference to it in my homily, is sexuality. Nothing wrong with sex. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here, right? But how many abuses, right? Premarital sex and adultery and homosexuality and pornography. That's, that's an abuse. Using the person as an object, right? There's nothing wrong with sex. But how easy it is to abuse that. This is part, this is part of the exercises. So any, any, any gift can be used properly or can be abused. Got it? Okay, then the third part of principle and foundation is called holy indifference. Holy indifference. Now, if you say the word indifference in American English, do you have a synonym of that? I have a, I have a synonym of that. For me, indifference, apathy. Apathy. Like the young people, they call it the whatever generation. Whatever, huh? Spanish, que me importa, que me importa, que me importa. The whatever generation. That is not holy indifference. Holy indifference is the exact opposite. Holy indifference is this. You want to try through these exercises to discern what is God's will for you. And you want to carry it out. Even though it might be difficult. If you want to experience peace in your lives, you have to try to discern what is God's will. The great Italian writer Dante Alighieri in the Divine Comedy, what do we see as he's entering into heaven with St. Bernard? Any of you ever read the Divine Comedy? At the very top in the ark it says, in his will is our peace. We want to experience peace in our lives. It's going to be what in doing God's will. And the purpose of these exercises, Ignatius says, is to order the disordered. Have any disorders in your life? Your, your life is probably a ball of confusion. Emotionally, morally, spiritually, socially, dysfunctional families, we're living in a, in a state of confusion almost, perpetually. The exercises can help us to order the disordered. You ever study Our Lady Guadalupe? Remember when Juan Diego gathered the roses? Remember that? December 12th? He goes to Mary. What does Mary do with the roses? Beautiful story. What? Yeah, she, doesn't she put them in an orderly way? So, if you want to do these exercises, give yourself to Mary. Mary will help you to really have a well-ordered series of 
meditations. You place yourself in Mary's hands. Okay, now we arrive at really what, what is holy indifference? Are you listening? Buckle your seat belts now, okay? No, we're going to Magic Mountain now, okay? We're going to the big one, okay? You don't want to prefer, don't want to prefer a long life to a short life. You don't want to prefer health over sickness. Uh oh. You don't want to prefer riches over poverty. Wow. One more. You don't want to prefer honors over humiliations. Wow. But you want to choose what is most conducive for the end for which you're created, which is the honor and glory of God and the salvation of your soul. That's called holy indifference. Now I see the, sh the shocking look on your faces, okay? Uh, come back next week, okay? Half of the battle of holy indifference is understanding it. Because listen, whether, whether you want it or not, you're going to die one day, right? Whether you, whether you want it or not, the, our, our health starts to decline. My father, who died two years ago, he, the last three years of his life, he died at 88. Uh, my mom is still living, would say, you know, Joan, your body falls apart one piece at a time. <laughs> So, you know, our health is going to, it declines. Riches or poverty? The richest person in the world and the poorest is going to end up in the same place, six feet beneath the ground, right? Have you ever gone to a funeral, any of you? Did you ever see, following a funeral, a U-Haul van? Have you ever seen that? Have you? You can't take it with you, right? So, whether or not we got money or not, we're going to die poor. But if we, if we love God, we die rich. I'm going I'm to tell you, the richest person in the world. Are you listening? The body of Christ? The body of Christ? The body of Christ? Amen. You receive the Eucharist in the state of grace with fervor. You are the richest person in the universe because you have Jesus Christ beating within your heart. Amen? Amen. I was teaching confirmation and I was asking the boys, How, what would you like your last meal to be? One kid said, a Big Mac. <laughs> Tacos. Black Angus, the sirloin steak. Domino's pizza! One guy in the class said, I'd like my last meal to be Holy Communion. That was me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Father, yeah. <laughs> and then humiliations, they're going to come. About a month ago in the parish, uh, this man came up to me and said, Father, please come to bless our home. It was his home in Hawaiian, it burned down in Hawaiian Gardens. He wanted me to bless the new home. And I reluctantly went. Then he arrived at the house and he was there. His wife was there, his daughter was there, about five of his grandchildren were there. I was blessing the house. And I was there for about six or seven minutes. And one of the, one of the grandchildren looked at me and he approached me and he said, by the way, when are you going to get out of here? <laughs> that happens. And the fact that I, I know holy indifference and honors and humiliations, 
Not that it doesn't hurt. But I find myself angry at that kid, but they started to pray for that little kid. And Lord, bless that little squirt. Okay, now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a New York expression, by the way. No. <laughs> so if we don't, if we understand uh, holy indifference, you understand it, then once the circumstances arise, you beg for the grace. So, um, starting tomorrow, I am going to offer a novena for all of you. Say thank you, Father. Thank you. So I thought that deserved a thank you, huh? So starting tomorrow, I'm going to be offering a novena for you every day for nine days. When I offer my Mass, I'm going to be placing all of you on the altar so that these 10 weeks will be the best 10 weeks in your life. So may God bless you today, tomorrow, and always until you get to heaven. Amen. Amen.